over to their farm, but he's embarrassed by the old-fashioned outdoor toilet outhouse. He kept uh, pestering his dad for a modern indoor one, but his dad wouldn't give in. So out of sheer desperation, he slips out one night and puts a lot of dynamite behind the outhouse and blows the whole thing into oblivion. The next morning at breakfast, his father asked him if it was he who destroyed the outdoor of the outhouse. And at the same time, remind him of the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. Yes, Dad, sighed the boy, it was me. I'm glad you're honest, said his father. And as a punishment, you have to start digging the pit for a new one immediately. But Dad, protest the boy. When George Washington admitted it was he who cut down the tree, his father didn't punish him. Yes, you're right, said his father, but George's dad wasn't in the cherry tree when he cut it down. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear Lord, this morning as we get into your word, we thank you for your presence here. and We thank you for the power that's in your word and that we have access to it and that we are not only allowed but encouraged to use it, Lord. So just bless this uh, sermon today and uh, guide and direct it in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you or anyone is set free from sin, a battle has been won. You are in the clutches of Satan, the God of this world. But the enemy is determined to destroy what God has brought about in you. The battle isn't over. Sometimes it just begins at your time of salvation. The enemy always tries to destroy any work of God, but your effectiveness in bringing the gospel to sinners is especially threatening to him. Amen? Jesus won the ultimate victory. He did it for us who accept him, who love him, and live for him, he shares the victory with us. Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We all have battles to fight. We all have battles. Some have physical battles. We've all been there. We've all had physical battles. Bob's got a physical battle. Boyd has a physical battle. We all do. Some have battles with emotional turmoil, stress when everything seems to go wrong. We have battles to fight, but we have a mighty, undefeated warrior to come to our aid. Amen? There's a war on, a war for souls. The war started in the Garden of Eden. It's possible to be at war with God and Satan both. When you're before you're saved, you're at odds, you're, or you're war, at war with God and probably didn't know it, but we were. And Satan was at war with us. So we were at war with God and Satan both. You cannot win until you get saved. Amen? Capitulate. That means surrender. That's why I wanted us to sing that song about surrender. Capitulate to God through faith in Jesus. Accept him as Savior, Master, and Lord. Then you will only be at war with Satan. And Jesus defeated him already. How about that? He won't stop trying to defeat God's work in you, but you and Jesus win the battle and eventually win the war. Amen? So first thing in, I mean, we'll have these battles. We have doubt fires, doubt storms. We have physical battles. We have emotional battles. But first thing you need to do is recognize your enemy. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Satan is the author of misery. Satan is the author of doubt. The ungodly world would have you think that there is no such thing as a devil. The ungodly world would have you think that the problems of life are the, re the result of the activities of mankind. Marxism is the result of that kind of thinking. Fanatical climate cultism is the result of that kind of thinking. Alphabet perversion. You know what I'm talking about? Alphabet. Do you know what I'm talking about? LG, et cetera, et cetera. Perversion is a result of that kind of thinking. Believers need to be aware of their hideous, ungodly social trends. Most of them leave God out of their decision-making process, recognizing the attempts of the enemy to keep you from carrying the gospel. There's a battle for souls. Number two, use the weapon. Our weapon is the word of God. Amen? Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. In Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Your weapon is God's holy word, which is our all-sufficient rule for faith and practice. Amen? 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
To be accomplished with a weapon, one must practice with it. Archery hunters practice with the bow. Rifle hunters practice on the rifle range. We have a rifle range at this church. I don't know if any other church in the world has a rifle range, but we do. You want to be a good shot? You got to practice. You want to be accomplished with the sword of the spirit, our weapon? Use it, read it, speak it, practice using the word. Pray scripture prayers. Number three, stay in communication with your commander. You know, if, if you're in an army, the commands come down through the chain of rank and, the, and then you gotta know what the commander expects of you. It comes down through the rank, it comes through the sergeant, it comes down. You gotta stay in communication. In other words, everybody's gonna run different directions and you can't win. Stay in communication with your commander. Who's the commander? God, God is. James 5, 3, 13 to 16, is anyone among you in trouble? See, trouble is just one kind of battle that we encounter. Sometimes trouble is all that we see. It seems like trouble's all around us. Then it continues, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Prayer works. In the King James, it's the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. That's kind of like it that way. Fervent prayer. What does fervent mean? It means heated. It means passion. It implies passion. Fervent prayer has emotion behind it. Number four, stay in the battle. Don't ignore the enemy. Realize that there is an enemy coming against you. The enemy brings battles to you, hoping to derail your effectiveness in spreading the gospel, the good news. It's easy to ignore the battle or to walk away from it, hoping that the troubles will just go away. Some battles that you fight are for other people's souls. People around us are on the way to the flames of hell. You might be the only believer that someone will encounter before they perish. They're lost without God. Don't give up on a sinner. The battle has to be won. Don't give up. Don't turn back. Don't give up. Don't think that you have to be in a certain place. Don't think that you have to be dressed a certain way. Be a warrior. You can do it. I've been called to go in a hospital to minister different people on their deathbed. Some of them I didn't even know who they were. And I prayed them into the kingdom of God. Would you do that? You should be ready to do that. What if someone you know is on the verge of dying and you know that, they, that they're not believers? Would you go and try? Would you do that? Would you prepare yourself in case that happens? What if you come across an accident and somebody's bleeding out, but they're awake? Do you know the Lord is your Savior? You, you may not survive this. Do you, want to be, do you want to be a believer? You can do that. You can do that. God will empower you to do that. 
You don't have to be, you don't have to go to Bible school. You don't have to be a minister. We're all ministers, amen? That was weak. <laughs> that was really weak. <laughs> Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. I'm glad you thought of it. <laughs> Ephesians 5.15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Opportunities come along. Recognize your part as a soul winner. Opportunities. We don't just get saved and that's the end of it. We have experienced the goodness of God. We've been set free from the law of sin and death. We can't keep that blessing to ourselves. God expects us to be gospel-carrying soul winners. Amen? I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm just trying to give you a little more, wind you up a little bit. How's that sound? Need a little winding? I need winding up once in a while. Number five, don't be afraid. Have faith. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Carrying the gospel is not without challenges. There's always a battle. There is opposition. God is on our side. Amen? Sinners should be afraid, but they're not. To their destruction, they're not afraid. The other day there was an advertisement on television and it was Ronald Reagan's son, who's an atheist, encouraging people to be atheists. And his last word was, I'm not afraid to be, to die and go to hell. Because he doesn't believe there is one. And there are millions like that. That's one of the mantras of Marxism. There's no God. You know, when uh, there was a news, not a news thing, but on, 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 this, on the 700 Club, they were interviewing a pastor, and he's, there's an organization that's a missionary organization, and Nicaragua, five of them are in prison because that's a Marxist country, and they were having huge revival meetings. And the Marxists can't stand that, and these five pastors now are in prison. Don't think that can't happen here. Number five, be holy. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness is being separate from the world and separated unto God. We are God's possession. He bought us with a price. While we were st still in our sins, he died for us. The price was his blood. Now, we have to live a life that is pleasing to him. Because we belong to him. We can't expect to keep, to keep one hand in the world and reach out to God with the other hand. We can't give lip service to God and live worldly. We can't serve both God and mammon. It doesn't take a big person to serve God, but it takes all of the person. You don't have to be big like Scotty. <laughs> you don't have to be big to serve God, but you have to have all of you in it. Amen? That's the thing. You have to be all in. We have personal battles. We all do. And we can bring victory to 
into the lives of people around us, loved ones, co-workers, people we know, people, neighbors. So it's good to review our commitment from time to time. We should ask God to show us anything in our life that's unsatisfactory to him. Do you invite that scrutiny? <laughs> that's something we should do. Lord, show me. Am I, am I going astray? Am, am I, are my thoughts far from you? Do I, do I worship you enough? Do I read you enough? Do I pray enough? Do I listen to you in my prayer time? We should ask God to show us anything that's unsatisfactory to him. Do we do that? I don't do it often enough. Psalm 51, verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. This is a prayer that we should all pray. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. David had a lot of battles, a lot of battles. And David had failures, don't we all? And that was his prayer. Create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In our battles, we need a steadfast spirit. We need renewal. Can we come together and just renew our commitment to serving, to serving? Can we just gather one more time down around here? I'm going to close with this. Can we do that and just renew our commitment to serving God? There's only a few of us here. Come on down. If you need to sit, there's empty seats here.